Hello again, Helena. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. What so are we going to talk about now? I was thinking, OK, okay. I imagine I'm a, I'm a game developer. Mm -hmm. I have been working in my video game for two, three years. With working my team. hard. Working hard. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be amazing. Total success. Mm -hmm. Boom. I have, my, I have my game ready. Mm -hmm. And now? Well, if you have a good partner, uh, maybe you can make that game a real success. I okay, mean, I, can, I can make it my own, is what you mean. You but what about if, if I'm an indie company? I need to find a publisher, I guess. Yeah, no, well, most of the, most of the companies, most of, most of the studios uh, try to find a good partner to get their games into the market. Those partners are, uh, generally speaking, uh, publishers, what we call game publishers. But there are a lot of, um, you know, different kind of publishers uh, that approach the game developers when they are finishing that great product. We wanted to know um, a little bit more about the game publishers. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we invited what we believe are four of the top publishers that we any game developer can uh, um, can, uh, can work meet. with these yeah. days. Okay? So th they would be the perfect match for a lot of game developers. Yeah, we're talking days. about Devolver Digital, we're talking about Humble Bundle, we're talking about Team 17, and we're talking about Kowloon Knights that is not exactly a publisher, but it does many of the things a good publisher yeah. does. They are an investor as well, yeah. an investment fund. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what we want to find out today is what uh, someone like uh, Terence Mosca, the, the um, uh, publishing director of uh, Tequila oh. Works, one of the most successful indie studios in the world, face every day. It's like, how does Terence uh, find that good publisher for Tequila? Well, that th those kind of questions he has uh, are generally the same questions yeah. any game developer will have. How to work. navigate no? mm -hmm. that uh, untangled world of publishers, developers, mm -hmm. producers, and so on and so. So we are facing Terence with those four publishers represented by uh, their leading people, or some of their leading people. We're talking about Nigel Lowry, the co-founder of the Bulber Digital. We're talking about Debbie Best week uh, that is the CEO of Team 17 talking about Eduardo Aparicio that is the publishing uh, um, uh, the B B VP of publishing at, at Humble Bundle and we're talking uh, of course about Samuel Lee that is the CEO at a very uh, well-known these days Kowloon Knights. So let's say hi to them. Say, let's say hi to them. They are in very different parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, in uh, uh, Hong Kong as so well. Some of them having breakfast, some yeah. of them having lunch. A little bit of everything. So, yeah. hello guys. Hello uh, Samuel. Hello Nigel, Eduardo, and hello Debbie. And of course, hello Terence, uh, that is in Madrid. Uh, thank you for joining us in this virtual stage of Game Lab from very different, different parts of the world. Um, and thank you for joining. Um, Terence, um, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to be good in this panel. I want to ask you to be uh, not either bad, but I want you to, to use the time that we have, the hour that we have, to get the most uh, meaningful information for all the game developers out there that are nowadays looking for publishers. Uh, what do you think uh, are the main uh, questions they are asking themselves and, and try to get the best possible answers from these amazing guests that we have today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon or good morning, because right now is the afternoon, but I don't know when it will be broadcast and it will be morning or afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice good to day. be here. Good day. Good day is a good one. Yes. Uh, good day. So very nice to be here. So I guess first, um, even if I'm sure most of the developers and publishers and people watching, uh, watching us right now knows about you guys, I think we'd still be good to make maybe do a first round of introduction that you can explain a little bit your company and the way that you're kind of working. 
uh, and then we will dig more into kind of uh, publishing, financing, and 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 distribution. So maybe you would say, well, Debbie, I will start with Debbie. If you can to introduce quickly Team Seventeen, make sure everyone knows very well about you guys. Hi, uh, firstly, um, thank you everybody for allowing us this opportunity to talk. Um, <clears throat> Very quickly, I'm Debbie, I'm the CEO, but one of the founders of Team 17. I think this year we celebrate our 30th anniversary as a business. Um, and throughout all that time, we've tried to remain independent as much as we could. And so we've had the lovely journey of being a publisher, then a developer, being a publisher, being a games label. So I think we've sat on pretty much both sides of the table all the way through our careers. Um, I think the key thing about what Team 17 do today is we genuinely look at this and go, how can we help developers bring the best possible games that they can to market? Um, and there are never two deals that are ever the same. I'm sure everybody else will say the same thing. I think that's what makes modern publishing so interesting today. You know, it's evolved where, you know, <clears throat> Contracts are for negotiation. People who say that their contracts aren't for negotiation, sorry. You know, we live in a different world today um, where nothing is off the table for discussion. So from funding to helping support developers with additional development resources to utilizing our internal labs from QA, usability, all the way over to our publishing groups. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I want to see the other guys smile too. So I think let's hand over to whoever's next. Sounds amazing. Nigel. Uh, my name is Nigel Lowry. I'm with uh, Devolver Digital, and I work in marketing and business development, but like a lot of people here, we work across everything. Um, and we are a game label, an uh, in, indie publishing label. have been around for about 10 years, 11 years now, I guess we're on. And um, yeah, we are. our goal is to find unique, uh, uh, interesting ideas and games from around the world, and from interesting uh, developers that we want to work with, and help bring them to a larger audience. Um, help them make the best game that they want, make the game of their dreams um, as easy as possible and bring it to the widest possible audience. And, and that's just our simple goal. And we do that in all manner of ways that, as we're here to talk about today, evolves uh, year to year, month to month sometimes. Great. Thank you. Eduardo? Eduardo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm Eduardo from uh, Humble Bundle. Um, Humble Bundle started right about the time that uh, Devolver did, a little bit later, 10 years ago, this, uh, this year we're celebrating. And was started by indie developers um, because the landscape 10 years ago for distribution and for publishing was very, very different. And um, they needed a platform to raise money to be able to continue development of their games. Um, it turned out that it was a pretty good business idea and uh, some of the people in the studio just uh, pivoted into working at Humble Bundle full time. And since then, we've tried to uh, always be indie first, our focus on supporting indie developers and being a force for good within the industry and publishing is just another evolution of that. We're uh, later to the game than some of the other uh, folks here, but um, still very passionate about doing uh, things in a way that uh, helps developers uh, be uh, better off uh, after their game release, where they can continue to be independent, even if they want or, or don't need a publisher up to them. But to, you know, our, our, our angle is we do try to complement the skills of our teams with, uh, with skill sets and with tools that they might not have access to um, by bringing in, you know, uh, people from, uh, uh, corners of the industry that maybe aren't so indie, but that do have a lot to offer to indie developers. Okay, great. And Samuel is a bit different, I mean, different perspectives. So that's interesting mm. to, uh, to kind of also understand what you're doing uh, with, uh, with, uh, with your company. Yep, yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, I'm Sam from Kalu Knights, um, and we're much younger than the other companies today. Um, we are almost three years old now. We started um, late 2017, um, and we are also a bit different that um, we are not a publisher per se, but uh, we do project financing. That's the uh, key that we do. So uh, we provide funding to uh, mainly PC and console premium game developers um, anywhere around the world, across any genre. Um, we provide them funding to make the game and also for the, in the cases, if they want to self-publish, we also include the marketing budget in it, of course. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, the games that we support uh, range from indie, um, like two, three people team, all the way to double A scale team, such as um, games like um, um, Gothel coming on PS5 and um, um, Starbase um, on, on PC. Um, so uh, a big range of developers that we support so far. And um, although we are quite young, we are already we have invested already in uh, more than thirty games. Um, and uh, for games that uh, are working with uh, for developers working with us. Um, because we don't do the publishing ourselves, um, we are much more hands-off. Um, we do let them choose their own path, so they can choose to work with the publisher. Again, for example, Golf is working with Gearbox, right? Um, and then for some of the teams that want to actually um, do self-publishing, then we facilitate it by introducing them to agency they can work with. Um, but ultimately, we let them choose their own path. So that's, um, that's pretty much what we do. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, to start with, I think uh, we start with kind of when a developer comes to see you guys, kind of what will be kind of a good timing for a developer to start discussions with you and what kind of you're looking uh, for working into a developer, uh, working with a developer. I mean, you, we, we know that it's not a specific genre, uh, it's not a specific team, but there are kind of some stuff that kind of shine with a developer and makes you want to work with them. So that's kind of what we'd like to understand on, from your side, what, what are those shiny elements that you look into a developer. Uh, who wants to start? Eduardo, I'll jump in real quick. Oh, you Sorry. grab it, Nigel. <laughs> I was just gonna say, we've tried to distill this down over uh, the past few years because we get that question. That's a great question. Everyone wants to know when, the, when should we show our game uh, and there's two things that I, I try and leave with them is one is when it's ready to illustrate what's going to make it different, right? And that might be a gray box or a white box or what kind of prototype stage because it's very much based on gameplay and how the game looks and feels and controls. Um, but maybe further down the road where there's a lot more polish to the visuals because uh, maybe like a, a game we worked on Gris that requires this really high level of polish to the art to understand what's going to make it different. So that point in which you can say, this, this game that we're working on, this is why it's special. This is why it's different. Uh, up until then, it's, it, that conversation can happen. And that's the second part. Don't, you shouldn't think of it as a one-time, here's my game. Fingers crossed. I hope you like it. Our goal is to make sure, and I think a little, a little one's goal is to be, um, show us over time. You can introduce yourself. This is what we're working on. This is what we're going towards. And this is not our formal pitch yet, but we wanted to get on your radar. And I think that's an important piece, too. As uh, people shouldn't think that uh, I have to wait till it's just fun or it's just interesting. Um, you can introduce yourself over time because that works quite well too to be able to understand where you're going. And then when you're to a point and you're saying, please uh, cast judgment on my game, uh, say so. Uh, otherwise, we're happy to see it along the way because game development is a journey anyways. Um, so that's kind of what I know we've distilled it down to a little bit to, to make sure people know that uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's multiple touch points you can show, and the one that we're ready to make a decision is when you can say, this is why it's different. Yep, and um, just adding to the different part, um, being different part, like it could be the game itself, could be, you know, even the team, right? So for example, if you're a team that already has um, more track record, then obviously, even if you show something much earlier, like you have a better chance, right? So I, I really like the way Nigel summarized it. I never thought about it that way, but I think it's a good um, summary that make yourself different. Um, no, I totally agree, Sam. Um, Nigel really well said there how you put it across. I think one of the things that um, we look at, more so probably from a development point of view, we're very aware uh, there are indie developers who have come from the games industry, you know, games people like the Overcook team, they worked at Frontier beforehand. Uh, however, we do work with a number of partners that have never made a video game before. Um, and often having those early conversations really does help. You know, we can help you in terms of making sure that you're using the right tools for development, that you that we're helping you look at the production side and milestone it out, look at the teams that you need, you know, the amount of developers that I speak to who come forward with a great concept, have something that looks quite nice in the early stages, but then when we dig into it, you find out that their plan is to bring it online network play across multiple platforms, day one launch, and then you look and see that they've got one programmer. You know, um, <clears throat> there's a huge amount of work that we can do ahead of analyzing just what team resources you need to support you to make sure that you've got the right size team in place to deliver that vision. Yeah, and I mean, I don't usually agree with Nigel, 
But uh, I think in this case, <laughs> I'll have to agree. <laughs> no, I mean, it is really, really true. And I think that it's also important when you talk to a publisher that you uh, try to communicate where your game is at. Um, you know, we all understand and we all have played games that are very, very early on in development, but it's hard for us to know which parts of the game to judge, judge harshly or to look at more closely and which parts to kind of like uh, understand that they're like very, uh, you know, you know, pre-alpha phase. So, yeah, I think that communicating that, making sure that when we're, uh, you know, or when your publisher or your potential publisher is evaluating your game, that they understand where everything stands. Where does the game, game stand visually, UI-wise, story-wise, characters, all this kind of stuff so that we can judge it fairly and understand kind of where you're going. But definitely, if your key differentiator, the thing that makes your game innovative and different isn't yet, you know, fairly well nailed down, it's going to be hard for anybody to really evaluate uh, whether your game uh, and your team can accomplish what it's uh, trying to do. Yeah, yeah just to go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, the one thing none of us answered was about the genres. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all pretty genre agnostic. Um, we look for great games, you know, um, irrelevant of what genre they're in. I think all of us work in that space. Yeah, and I think what, what I'm hearing as well, and that's part of the, I mean, I think one of the backbone of this conversation is how you look at building a long-term relationship with the developers. And, and therefore, it's not just a one-off, come up from one project, we have a discussion, we take it out, and that's done, which maybe I've seen as a bit like a traditional kind of publishing model, and that's the publishing model they're putting in place right now is more how you build this kind of stronger relationship. And that starts from, from day one, actually, from just kind of, starting to come with you guys, introducing the team, even if the project is just very early on, that you, you, you kind of build this, this know-how of each other. I think that's, that's very, very interesting and very important. Um, going back to coming after that, let's say after the pitch, I want to discuss with you more on the financing aspect of it. So what we see right now is a lot of different financing means for games, uh, way more than a few years ago. Obviously, I mean, uh, Samuel, you are talking about kind of self-publishing, but can be some kind of co-publishing. You have some platforms putting money into the projects. We have obviously project finance. You can have potentially, why not, some equity, some publishers. So what I'd be interested in each of you when you have kind of different models, because you are not the same kind of type of publisher, uh, especially between kind of Kowloon, uh, Kowloon Team 17, uh, or even uh, Amber Bundle. So, what I want to understand from you guys is how each of you are kind of uh, appreciating and working with those different ways of, uh, of financing games. I don't know who wants to start. So um, I guess I, I can give it a, give it a try. Um, I think that there are a lot of ways uh, to uh, get money for your game nowadays. Uh, a lot more than there were, you know, two years ago, definitely more than five years ago, where you could, um, you know, you, you don't really need a publisher to get funding. You could get money from platforms, you could get money from VCs, you could get money from certain governments, you know, there, there are a lot of sources. Um, and, um, you know, for us, even, uh, I think as publishers, for all of us, those opportunities also exist, uh, like the platforms for um, de-risking the um, the projects that we invest into to make sure that you know the developers can really just focus on making a good game and not worry so much about what the outcomes might be and those are good to definitely explore and um but yeah i think that the key thing with all of those and not that i think that we could really give a, a you know a good course right now on each option but is understanding what those options are and also understanding what is a good deal and what isn't um, so it's always good to, if you are evaluating different options, be it from a publisher, be it from one of us, or be it from a platform or from anybody really, is just make sure that you talk with as many people as possible to understand kind of where those terms are falling and the asks that you're receiving in comparison to what is being given to you to make sure that you are not like putting yourself in a position that in the long run could potentially be bad for your team or for your game. So. I think that's a really good point, Eduardo, the last one too, is you can get, as he said, you can get money from a lot of different resources and that could be a whole other topic of like, 
the pros and cons of these different resources, but understanding um, what the ask is from that person, what they're going to get, what that money is worth. It's not just the money to operate your, your studio and to make this game. What else are you going to get out of it? And there's different uh, options, right? What Kowloon Knights and what Devolver offer are different. Both are very, very good. It depends on what you as a studio need. Um, you also have to look at over time, I think a lot of uh, things that we're hearing, you know, from from different funding sources, whether it be first party or, you know, investors, what you're getting now, what you're signing up for now could not be, you need to understand what that's, what that value is in like three years when that game comes out, right? Um, if you're asking for, uh, you're signing up for exclusivity or you're signing up for this platform or that platform now, be able to you know, think about it, project, okay, I'm signing up and taking this money now. What does that mean for the game? Not right now, not for the next few months of development, but what, um, what hooks and what stipulations are in there that are going to affect my game three years from now? Because um, I think that's what a lot of the difference is. If you're signing for exclusivity now for a game that comes three years from now, what does that mean? What is that platform going to look like in three years? Do you have confidence in that platform? Do you have confidence in that publisher? Do you have confidence in that investor to still be there um, and doing the things that they promised to do? So it's not a simple exchange for the, at the moment. It's an exchange that's going to last three, four, maybe 10 years down the line when you're talking about <clears> the length of the game. <throat> yep. Um, yeah, just more specifically, because um, I, I think Kowloon Knight is a bit different um, from the, uh, from the other, uh, others on the panel. So for us, like, as I mentioned earlier, we do the funding part but we're much more hands-off when it comes into your development and the publishing side, et cetera, right? So if you're a team that already like, um, released games before or you had that experience or like, your team have people that can handle that part for you, then we could be a very good source for you because you, know, you can self-publish, you can keep all the branding to your own studio, et cetera, right? Um, and on the other hand, like, we have turned down games that we really like, but because we know that they will require a lot of hand-holding, um, when, when, when it comes to releasing the game and all that. So in, for those cases, then, you know, you're much better off working with, you know, Team 17, Devolver, Humble, etc., which they, they will provide more, more support for you. Um, and um, one more thing I also want to add, um, because there are so many sources where you can get money now, you should really explore them um, as much as you can. Um, a few times that we've come into developers where I, I think they signed a deal too early, right? Um, they go out one offer, um, they don't want to keep bothering and you know going all the pitching and all that so they just stop there um whereas um after i learn about the deal or whatever we do think that they can have better options out there whether it's us or other um, parties out there so um do explore your options absolutely just to touch on that i think one um one great source of funding as well as being Kickstarter. You know, don't forget gaming has been, I think they were one of the first to break through a billion in terms of funds raised from a crowdfunding source. Um, for the right titles, they are still incredibly important. And I won't repeat what the other guys have said because they're all absolutely right about what they're saying. I think just touching on that point that Sam just mentioned, um, you know, signing deals too soon sometimes. Um, I do come across quite a few teams where they have done platform deals or um, different distribution deals, you know, way too early. And by that, I'm only going to say way too early because actually they could have earned significantly more revenue had those games been developed further with more polish and allow some marketing and other areas behind them. So, you know, not only by signing those deals early could it impact where those people will be in three years' time, you could actually be leaving a lot of money on the table by not allowing the game to grow and develop as it should do before you take it out to those platforms and discuss them. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, for developers, it's always kind of the chicken and the egg, you know, kind of uh, issue, <laughs> which is obviously, yes, you're great to wait for a better solution, but at the same time, you know, you need to finance your development and you cannot always wait. So that's kind of, uh, of the difficulty. Uh, what, one question is, did it create, uh, do you have any cases where basically because a game was kind of, as you say, kind of signed too early, maybe in distribution, in platform rights or whatsoever, it kind of stops you to kind of pursue on working on those kind of titles? Yeah, everybody. Absolutely. There's a, <laughs> there's a game that we just talked with like the tech. developer. And yeah, totally. There's a game that's signed with uh, a platform and the deal was for, they thought that would cover their development and it's not even going to cover 25% of the development um, and they need more. And now that game has an opportunity for a publisher or a partner 
is a lot more difficult because uh, they've signed exclusivity and they've signed on for this and for that. And it limits the upside of what that is. Um, and you look at it and go, I don't know how they're going to recover this level of investment easily. And it's so I don't blame them for doing it because at the time they felt that's what was right for them. Um, but at the same time, uh, now that the, the, they, they got funding, decided, oh, well, we're good. We're going to scale this up. Well, they didn't think that through. And now they're, they, they're kind of in a tough spot. And so I think that uh, to your point, yes, you need to get your game funded, but you have to really, really understand your scope and scale what you're doing and that what you're asking for, what you're signing up for long term is going to pay off for the studio and the game. Uh, and not really hamper you because now uh, you're maybe even in a worse position than before. So um, absolutely have had to, to, to decline working with games because they are under parameters, whether they be territorial or platform restricted or something like that, that makes it uh, impossible for us to really work with them. Yeah, totally echoing Nigel there. Um, more than often it happens and, you know, sometimes games have been signed up on the back of a gif or something on social media where the game's actually not even fully fleshed out what it may be and that's where the budget side of it comes into play you know where people have got very excited because it's had a few thousand likes or retweets on social media um <clears throat> we come across it quite often where you know some of those titles just simply aren't fleshed out you know you know um even on crowdfunding i also remember the escapist and you know chris bless him uh, he ran a small Kickstarter, and I think when I first met him, we were sat down talking about it, and I said, so how do you actually escape? This game called The Escapist, right? And he turned around and he went, I've not figured that out yet. And so we had to put designers with him. Uh -huh. and, I, and, you know, my response was, don't worry about it. That's what we're here for. We can help you do that part of it by giving game designers um, who do this for a living. Um, now, in a case of a game like that, you know, it also had to be rewritten because it was written in Fusion, um, which wouldn't go across multiple platforms as well. Um, <clears throat> do, had he have signed with a platform, I doubt that game would have ever been released, is a good example, because the technology, it wouldn't port across to some of those platforms. Um, <clears throat> but also, he would have really struggled to actually ever execute that game and bring it to market in the way that it was, um, because there were so many important decisions that still needed to be made Never mind launching the game, you know, this is actually making a game. And that has to always be at the forefront, you know, regarding physically making them. I think there's, you know, on the funding side, there's never been a better time, let's be honest, um, to get funding for games. You know, um, in my 35 years, this is the best I've ever seen. Um, there are plenty of places where you can get concept funding. There are publishers that do early stage funding and go on to second stage funding. You know, um, so I think it's about being transparent and being very honest about where you currently sit, what your problems are, and the right partners will honestly sit there and help you. That's what we're here for. So you will advise the developer. Of, sorry, I was gonna say, that's a very good point that Debbie just made real quick, is that uh, everyone on this panel has been through many, many deals and dealt with many, many other partners um, platform, territories, whatever it is. And there's something that um, what you might be getting now uh, as a solo developer with a game idea from a platform could be five, tenfold if you're with a partner because um, the partner can leverage the relationship, leverage their portfolio of games uh, to maybe make something bigger. Um, that's, you know, that's a pro, I think, of working uh, with a publisher or a funding partner because they have leverage sometimes to work with and history and references to say, well, this is worth this much at this stage. Um, and, and, and publishing isn't for everybody, but that is definitely one of the high points of, of that kind of group um, leverage that you might have with somebody. Yeah, and I mean, I think it all comes down to risk, right? So a platform is going to make an offer not that's lower, not because they're evil, but because they assign a certain risk to whatever they're trying to invest in. Having a, you know, a, a well-known publisher or investor attached to your game is going to make it uh, so that your game is already validated. It's like, I mean, in the United States, it's like if you went to Stanford or something like that, 
automatically <laughs> your resume goes to the top of the pile because that kind of validates that you at least are worth talking to. Uh, and people are going to give you potentially, you know, better offers and all that kind of stuff when it comes to, to games. Yeah. And you've uh, actually also, just reminded uh, me we're... of a couple, sorry. You, I was just going to say, you just reminded me totally just to finish that point of a conversation that a platform holder had with me as a developer. Um, despite the fact it was related to worms, despite the fact that we had sold many millions of units, they told us that they didn't like doing deals with one-off studios with one product because it was high risk. I won't name the platform. Yeah, IPs are bad, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was just, I was just going to add also, um, yeah, um, also um, not just because we have a lot of experience dealing with the platforms and knowing sort of what offer they can give, but also, um, you know, a lot of platforms, they always undergo personnel changes as well. And uh, just because how frequent we interact with them, we are always, always quite up to date to who we should be talking to for each platform. So I think that's another benefit of you um, working with a partner, whether it's a publisher or funding partner, um, because we, are also, we know who to talk to and to speed up the process and all that. That's a very good point too. That's a great point. These folks of these, they change out a lot and there's not a lot of consistency. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, I like that a lot. So you would advise a developer to kind of uh, have a continuous discussion with you and when those kind of opportunity rise on a project, potentially come to you and say, okay, I have this opportunity. Are you still interested in my project? Can we try to do something together? Do we do this opportunity or we don't, but kind of have a kind of an open discussion with kind of more than publishers as you guys? Yeah, I think so. I would say so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and the just question uh, sorry, anecdotally, is, uh, we, sorry, just the anecdotally, we've had a, a couple of situations where we were in the process of uh, talking to a game, potentially signing it, and ended up signing it while they were in negotiations with platforms and have been able to get them way better deals just by taking over those conversations. Um, it is true that because we are involved at that point, you know, we do need to discuss like what, what's uh, in it for, for the publisher. But even then the developer was way better off than if they had gone at it themselves. So. And, and the question is because, I mean, there are, as you said, so many ways to finance, so many ways to finance, but there is also, um, and so to publish, but there are also so many ways now for people to interact. I mean, not at this time of COVID where we are all at home, but normally when we have, uh, we go to all those conferences, we interact. And so developers will interact with obviously with platform, with financiers, with publishers. So the, the, the question I'm, um, I've got for you here is it can, uh, it can land us to very different kind of publishing deals. Uh, which uh, can be obviously potentially kind of co-publishing deals, self-publishing deals. So how do you kind of, I mean, how open are you now in terms of publishing deals and how you publishing deals, how variable they are from what they, maybe they used to be in the past with kind of very traditional milestone, milestone payment release, rep share or no rep share. So um, what kind of flexibility uh, do you see today in the different deals you're doing with developers uh, regarding publishing deals? Well, I remember those old deals, right? Um, I lived, we lived in that world for a very long time, um, very much milestone driven um, on multi-million pound contracts, right? Um, I think over 12 years, we worked with 10 of the largest publishers in the industry, which, um, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the word publisher for a reason. I remember my missed milestone payments um, on a few titles and I still get those shivers that run down my spine. I think the reality is, you know, none of us are doing this for charity. We are a business and I think that has to be stressed and the equally is no such thing as free money, but the right partners will understand when a milestone will not be achieved, you know, and there's many ways. Some people have no milestones on our label. Some have some milestones. Um, often it's more about actually helping them track the development of the game as opposed to payments. You know, if we know somebody's struggling, we absolutely go outside of it and make payments anyway if they need the payments. So it's not a problem. It's about getting to the end result that needs to be achieved. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I second that. That's exactly the same thing. 
Yeah. And um, I think that it was mentioned earlier, but um, basically everything is up for negotiation. I think these days when you're negotiating a contract, it doesn't mean that uh, they'll, you'll really see like ludicrous contracts that don't make sense, but it means that you know, one uh, thing can give and the other one can take. There's always ways to adjust things so that a developer is happy with the outcome. Everybody has different uh, fears and of like what might be more detrimental to them or, or whatever, or what they think is a better deal or a worse deal. And uh, as publishers, um, you know, one of the things of there being so many great publishers nowadays is that we also have to be flexible if we even want to survive as publishers. So that's in the benefit of all developers. Um, and uh, yeah, again, I've seen basically almost any term you can imagine being negotiated and that's totally fine. I mean, again, it always, you have to understand that if you're taking from somewhere, you're gonna have to give somewhere else, you can't just take, but I mean, it's the same for the publisher side. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, for us, um, because again, we don't, we don't do the publishing per se, we're focusing on the funding itself. So by default, we're quite flexible. Um, we we define payment schedule and um, and and deliverables on the contract, but we actually those are more just um, deliverables. So we don't we cannot say no to that. Um, it's more uh, meant to be checkpoints. So they are not the what uh, we um, traditionally understand as a milestone. Um, and uh, and very often, uh, especially the last few months due to COVID and all that, um, things are delayed, and we understand it. Um, not only that, um, we do understand that um, as games go on, um, sometimes they get bigger, so they need more funding, and we're prepared to do that. We've done that for a few games already, where the game got further, um, start showing to the public, and got getting good reception, so we feel more comfortable as well at the time, then we are more open to also giving more funding um, to make the game bigger and better. So um, uh, I think we're quite flexible overall. I think at the bottom of all this, what everyone's you know kind of getting to is uh, the people on this panel are established, well-known publishers. And that isn't to say you can't sign up with, uh, and when I say publishers, I know, I know Calvin and is not a publisher, but you know, a partner, let's say. Um, they're established partners. You are going to, it's the same thing, it's the same reason why you're going to buy a certain brand at a grocery store, um, because you know that the consistent quality and it's going to be there. So you probably can do your homework on every one of us and some other other partners to understand what has the people's experience been by uh, been like in the past talk to other developers they've worked with have they been very strict with milestone have they been delayed payments for any reason because um, there are a lot of publishers to, to to eduardo's point there's a lot of great ones out there but there's also publicly a lot of bad ones uh, people that you've heard horror stories that have been uh corroborated and uh with by other developers and you need to understand that um, it's a relationship like anything else. You're making a purchase, you're making, a, you're forming a relationship, whatever you want to call it. And that uh, understanding who you're working with on the other end is going to, they have a history, most likely. If they don't have a history, uh, Godspeed and good luck, right? Um, but if they do have a history, you have to understand what you're getting into and maybe the flexibility and the experience you can, you can expect there. Um, and that's an, I think that's going to be more and more important as more people enter uh, any sort of industry and in any sort of sector with money in hand saying, here, uh, I'll give you this if you give me that. You need to understand it, um, maybe how that's worked in the past for other people. Um, because uh, great pride of probably everyone here on the panel is the successes and uh, not just the big successes, but the small successes or the, or the, or the failures, really. Because I could tell you that there's developers out there that have made very, you know, uh, they, they squeaked by on some projects we worked together on, which we all knew was possibility going in, but they had a great experience. Uh, it was the best possible experience for them. And uh, they, we all understand maybe why the game wasn't as financially successful and we still work together on the next project. And we are looking for, to talk to those kind of people because milestones, funding, people you work with, that's all people can, can, can uh, put whatever kind of addressing they want on that when they're pitching to sign up for you. But the proof is in the pudding. You can look at their history and what people's experiences are and how flexible they've been and what they've done for them. And I think that will uh, help you as a developer feel comfortable in entering that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good, good. Uh, the other side. The other side. Thank you so much. Big fan. Big fan. <laughs>
Uh, one thing, because as a developer, uh, I mean, we are perceived, I mean, we always say we are as good as our last game. So even if you have like a long track record, I mean, if your last game was shit, I mean, people will always kind of remember that. So that that's one thing. And that's also one thing about to relay what you are saying, which is not only about milestone payment and finance. It's also making sure that your game reach its audience uh, and, 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 and is a success. As part of that, uh, we see more and more as developer that, I mean, we have our own fan base. You know, people are kind of coming and say, oh, this is a game from this developer. Uh, they kind of refer, I, I see it a lot when we have a problem, they come to the developer more than coming to the publisher. So we kind of, we feel like kind of, uh, um, this is very important kind of developing a studio and developing the studio's IPs. And what I want to hear from you is, therefore, how you nowadays collaborate more and more with developers also on the publishing side. So not only the finance, the mice, and all that kind of stuff, but also everything which is kind of marketing and distribution, which uh, is, is key to a publisher, but it's also kind of very key to the developer and it's very important for developers in today to be more and more involved into this process as well. Sure. Um, I think one of the key things, I think we've said this right from day one, um, we're here to help build the profiles and build franchises for our partners. You know, um, it's our jobs to help build those profiles um, for studios, some of them who have never been heard of um, and are making their first ever game. And that's a very, very, very important area. Um, I think sustainability always springs to mind for me, you know, um, building profiles, helping make studios sustainable because I believe sustainable studios actually create their best work. You know, um, my own experience of development days, you know, where we had good days and bad days, you know, um, when you're only focused on creating the best work that you can without the worries of all the other things, you create your best work. And, you know, one of the things that I think we've really tried to do is be as transparent as possible. You know, marketing is, you know, sure, we can make recommendations, we build plans, we do brand plans, um, we put recommended specs. We don't sign that off. Our partners sign that off. It's their baby, it's their product. So they buy into the journey with us. And so it's actually a full on process in terms of jointly making the right decisions for that game throughout the life cycle. If that helps. You've all gone speechless. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for I mean, for us again, we don't do publishing. So um, the um, the developers work with by default, they will be the ones self-publishing, which most of the cases are. Um, and I think we take the other approach where we let them do um, handle those things, and then uh, when they need help, we're here to support. When they need to find a you know, localization, QA, marketing agency, we have existing contacts that we can introduce them to. But if they're perfectly comfortable doing it themselves, we just check in with them periodically. So you know, we up to date with what's happening, but we don't interfere uh, when they are you know they know what they're doing and they've done it before. Um, so, um, so yeah, definitely they are like basically involved in the whole process. Yeah, and I think that each uh, each publisher or partner here has their own like mm. superpower in a way, where like they have something that maybe they're especially good at, and uh, and that they can partner especially well with developers on. Like I know, like Team Summit Team has an amazing development team that can really help a studio that needs that extra bandwidth, right? And so I think that for, for all of us, it's really about trying to complement the skills and, and the things that the teams uh, that we're working with have or don't have. Uh, for us, we're fairly involved on the production side, not in an obstructive way, but just in trying to help developers because we've seen a lot of, uh, of our developers, uh, you know, if they maybe don't have as much experience with project management, they can get to a point where they're extremely stressed out they're super behind. They don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that can, well, it obviously affects the game, but it affects them first and it affects them very, very negatively. So it's about like us trying to provide that expertise to help them so that they can basically have like do good project management, understand what their timelines are going to be like and not be stressed about money or just about working on the same project for years on and years on end when uh, that can be very, very tough. And, um, Again, like every partner is different. Some partners want to be very, very involved uh, on the developer side. Some want to be very, very involved on the marketing side. Some just all that they want to do is make their game and they don't want to worry about things. We, I think that all of us basically adjust to whatever the partner wants. And um, 
Right. Yeah, it's it's about providing you know uh, to fill those gaps, but also to just listen to the developer to see what they actually need and how involved they want to be in, in everything. That's exactly the same. I agree with Eduardo. Find somebody that will supplement your studio. Your studio has people that can do things really well, um, but find you know work find a partner that wants to work with you to supplement that. Is that in marketing? Is that in production? Localization? Gameplay testing? Whatever it is. Uh, some developers come to us and say, we got the people we want to localize our game. We don't want anybody else. We worked in the past. They get us. Great. Awesome. We will strike localization from our duties. Um, just finding that person that's going to work with you and collaborate with you is important. It's your game. You know, if it's your IP. When you want to make the sequel, you don't want to have a big marketing campaign that puts your IP in a, in a weird spot, right? And you want to be able to to uh, have input on all facets of it. And you also need to trust your partner that they're making the right decision too. I had yesterday a deep argument slash conversation or whatever you want to call it, because uh, I hate the key art that the developer came up with. Hate it. Told them I hated it. They understand. They hate the idea that I had for a trailer, right? Uh, but that's okay. Uh, it's important to be able to voice that and that uh, we can say that no one's sitting there staring at key art that they hate or a trailer that they hate, right? Um, Go back to the drawing board together, uh, figure it out. Uh, it'll make for the best product. I mean, uh, we definitely had, uh, we presented a trailer. They've been working on the background for a developer and they looked at it and go, this sucks. This is why it sucks. And you know what? They were right. Uh, we went back and we did a little bit of changes to what they, what they had and they're absolutely right. It's a 10 times better trailer. You just gotta have to be, you find a partner that's willing to accept that uh, they can be wrong too. And you have to be uh, open-minded when it comes to uh, things that a publisher or a partner has experience in, whether it be deals or marketing or testing, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing about, one thing that uh, publishers have experience, and I think one thing that very few developers have, uh, especially in Spain, is uh, Asia. And uh, and I, I want to hear you about how you see the Asian market because that's kind of looked like an unknown uh, for developers out here. And like, okay, well, it can be great. We can make a lot of money there, but how and with whom? So as you guys are experienced publisher and also on this market, it would be great to kind of hear your point of view on how to develop, uh, let's say, Western European uh, IPs and games in Asia. Yeah, um, I think I'll start on this one just because I'm, I'm based in Asia. Um, so um, yes, um, Asia is still a good market to be uh, to to get additional upside for your game. Um, with that said, um, the the model that you work with could be different, right? It could be working with a platform, for example, in China would be WeGame. Game, in Japan could be DMM platform, um, or working with a publisher, right? That takes a revenue share, but also um, especially for China because um, the licensing, um, the, the getting the government license is becoming very difficult um, these these days. Um, even if you have a publisher, they may end up not being able to get the license for you anyways. So your game is still only on Steam anyways. For th those cases, then, you know, you may consider instead of working with the publisher who takes a revenue share, um, you can work with marketing agencies. Um, there are plenty of them um, in the region as well that help you, you know, reach your influencers you want, go to the media, local media here, and also, also even manage your communities for you um, in the languages and markets that you want to. So there are different models that you should consider. Um, but overall, you know, um, for games that do well, um, Asia can still be a big portion of the revenue. And I think, you know, Devolver, Team 17, Humble all have similar games um, that do very well in Asia. Yeah, we opened Devolver China a few years ago with three uh, Shanghai-based employees um, that handle business developments, working to get those as impossible it is right mm -hmm. now to get approval of China on games. Um, but not just China, they work, uh, they work uh, mainly in China, extended regions, uh, and, and, and they handle the marketing. Because uh, one of the, they do a presentation to us every year about what's the latest that ha is happening in, in China. And it is really eye-opening, uh, even to us every year, that well, we talk about YouTube, we talk about Twitter, Twitch, uh, IGN, whatever, whatever you're trying to get your game out on. And those more or less don't exist uh, there, or they do, but not at the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the quantities or the, the extensions that you would think. You look at WeChat, you look at all the various um, twi uh, excuse me, streaming channels, and how they operate is very differently too. Like, you know, bits here on Twitch, 
Um, I'll never forget we're sitting there and, 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 and Sam, you may be able to tell me it was a streaming channel that instead of bits just dropping here in, in Twitch and it says, hey, Nigel dropped five bits. It's just a stream mm. of text coming across it. And the more they pay, the bigger the oh, yeah. text was. And this top streamer was just covered in text, which means they were making like $100 <laughs> a second. It was crazy. And it requires having a partner that understands what that is and what that means and how to insert your games and your marketing into that. Um, cause I don't know it. Uh, my partners here, uh, uh, we have no idea. And that's why we had it to start uh, Devolver China cause it is very different. And we have partners in Brazil, right? We, we employ us, uh, as Sam said, uh, agencies that specialize in Brazil or Russia and some of these markets that have some, some very unique, uh, marketing and distribution channels and entertainment channels that just, we would not know of. Um, and a lot of people uh, are doing that now. And I think it's important, uh, because you can't just focus on a Western audience. That's just silly. Go look at the steam charts and you'll, you're bound to see in the top 10, top 20, whatever, a game you've never heard of that doesn't even have an English localized store page because, mm -hmm. um, there are that many people in China purchasing it, um, yep. every minute. So it's, it's, it's crucial at this yep. point. And that's something going back to yep. a pro partner standpoint that developers often can't do on them, themselves. Yeah, um, um, just quick thing I think I didn't, maybe I didn't make so clearly. Um, so for, for China, um, or even actually Japan, Korea, like Steam is still a main um, platform, right? So to be successful in those markets, you don't need to have uh, other platforms. Those are additional platforms that you, there are additional platforms you can get onto to get more upside. But if your game has the localization and has the right partner, again, could be agencies, could be publishers, uh, that can help you market the game and, and, and operate the game in the, in the region, just being on Steam is totally fine. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, numbers will vary from title to title depending on the success that they have in China. But if you are a PC game and you're already on Steam, you're probably finding anywhere from 15 up to 40% of your revenue comes from China anyway. Um, and I think that's important to know. You're not missing out um, on the government rating side. Um, I think one of the really cool things that I've really enjoyed is doing, um, we have a bunch of partners over there, I think, Two of them are already announced, um, My Time at Portia and Neon Abyss are both Chinese right. developed games. So we have teams on the ground that we're working quite closely with um, and have done for the last few years. But I think some of the marketing side that we've been doing, certainly, you know, I like Nigel's text thing that goes across like this. I need to see more <laughs> of that, you know. Um, We've done some very, very good work, um, <laughs> specifically on games like Overcooked. I think it's called Divorce Kitchen in China. Um, you know, to... Yeah, that Divorce Kitchen. Awesome. You got it, you got it. Yeah, yeah different names, yeah. <laughs> right, um, but we did some very clever on the ground work that hadn't been done before. And, you know, and that was working with people within the region. I don't think we launch a game, you know, Something don't hold me to it in case there's one in early access um, without Chinese language support, you know. Um, and same with almost to the point where same with South Korea um, <clears throat> and also Japan. It's almost unheard of us now to actually put a game in development without those languages absolutely being essential. And I think if you're bringing games onto, you know, Switch in particular, Japan's a huge market if you get that right as well. Yeah, and I mean, I think that the the point about Steam being uh, such a good platform for reaching those territories is super important. You definitely should be prepared for those territories, but again, just being on Steam is already giving you a leg up that you don't need to know all the complexities of uh, doing deals with publishers and all kinds of stuff in those regions. You could on your own be successful there, uh, even if you are not able to run a marketing campaign specific for those ter territories, because there is a very good platform that gives you access to that. And so that's really, really good. Um, but then if you can also optimize for it, if you have some experience about what are the good opportunities, what are the bad ones, all that kind of stuff, it definitely will, will help. But again, like it's not um, a situation right now where if you want to succeed in China, um, you have to have a partner. But uh, definitely having a partner that has experience, and I think like Nigel said, like I, I have zero personal experience, but we do have somebody on the team that it knows that market perfectly, has been working in that market for, uh, for over a decade and understands how things work. That's super important as far as, you know, trying to gain like additional sources of like de-risking your development and giving you more like runway, giving you 
more possibilities for your next game, all that kind of stuff, because there are there is a lot of money to be made for sure. But it can be very, very tricky once you go outside of the, the safety of Steam to know what is a good bet and what is a bad bet um, out there. So, yeah. So um, I'm sorry um, because one we last point already. Um, oh, go ahead, go okay. ahead. Quickly, quickly. Just one last point. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, one sentence. While you don't need a local partner, you definitely need the localized language. So definitely localize your game in yes. the languages. Yeah, I'm sorry because we're coming already kind of almost to the end of the session. Yes. Let's address one, one more question. I can probably the most important Terence, question for the end. Okay, uh, just, I, 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 I give you like the minute question. to ask the question. question. Maybe, Maybe don't have the, the minute to answer it, but because <laughs> we're really, really... No, we uh, do, we do. We still have five minutes. Come on. Okay. Uh, no, the last question is, uh, I wanted to have, we have a very dynamic uh, development scene in Spain. So as almost all of you guys, not the of most of you guys are outside of Spain and you're working with a, hopefully a lot of studios in Spain, I wanted to kind of get your, your conclusion and your point of view on the Spanish market and how do you see it evolving in the future? I mean, I mean the I developer the market. Things... Not... Yeah, I mean sure. the developer market. I think on... Yeah, no worries. Um, I think one of the good things is the Spanish market has um, been moving quite swiftly. I think we've announced three Spanish games that we're working on. And I did check before this call because I thought this question might come up. Um, I checked how it was, how Spain was compared with other regions around the globe. We actually have more games and more partners in Spain than in any other country in the world as of today, to give you an idea. And if I turn that clock back three years, there was one on that. So that shows you how fast the Spanish market has been moving. And I think that's credit to people on this panel right now, but also developers as well. And that's highlighting the successes that Spanish development teams have had over the last few years. Okay. Yeah, similarly, we work with a few and um, over the past few years, and one of the things we've noticed is it's a really tight-knit development community across the country. Uh, everybody seems to know uh, everybody else, which is great for introductions. We've met a lot of developers, the developers we've worked with. There's a lot of very cool local uh, events happening there, more so than a lot of more, you know, developed indie scenes, even uh, the ones you might suspect being larger. I feel like there's a lot more activity happening in Spain. It's super encouraging to see because the games coming out of Spain are, are, uh, are incredible. Yep, um, and we also work with one uh, Spanish developer and also keeping a close eye on the market. Um, we do think it's a very good market to, um, to have more and more games coming out. Eduardo, only you, you're, you have a, a super hit now. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, well, I think that all of us have had a very strong games coming out from Spain already. Uh, Temtem, obviously, our, uh, our big, big Spanish hit here in Madrid, close to where I'm living, actually. But um, I think that the, there's a lot of credit also, and this is not to butter up Game Lab for another title next year, but events like Game Lab <laughs> that are so consistent <laughs> and that actually bring developers together and uh, I mean, there is a little bit of the Spanish spirit of just wanting to hang out and, and have beers together. But, you know, having these events are what uh, make the, the, the scene so strong. And again, like Nigel was saying, those regional events, um, I've gone to regional events all around the world. And a lot of times it's kind of painful because it feels like a super waste of time. And I'll be honest, like every time I go to a small event in Spain, I'm blown away by a couple of games that are just like so far above anything that you would expect to see at a small event. So, okay, so let's, let's commit next, next year, year to meet in Spain maybe, maybe. Uh, with many other people that are watching, yes. watching us yes. today. Okay, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to have you here uh, physically. We're gonna just go very fast over this horrible year with lots of horrible things happening, but hopefully uh, next year we can all get together again. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for your time, for your experience, for working with the Spanish developers, for working with great developers all around the world. And see you very soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye.